Hello, everyone. Uh, this is May Hanslick with Transportation for America. Uh, we are going to get started in just one minute, going to let a couple more folks get on the webinar. Thank you. All right, it looks like we have lots of folks joining, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, again, my name is May Hanslick, and I'm part of the team at Transportation for America, and we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Federal transportation policy is a climate change issue. What is Congress doing? This webinar is co-hosted by Transportation for America and Third Way. We are so thrilled that many of you were able to join us today to learn a bit more about this important issue. I'd like to first review the agenda and logistics for today's webinar. This webinar will provide listeners with an introduction to this issue. We'll first hear from Alex Blaska at Third Way, who will review the relationship between transportation and climate change. Then we'll hear from Scott Goldstein at Transportation for America, who will walk us through all the differences between the House and Senate transportation authorization and how the Senate falls short. Finally, we'll conclude with a question and answer period. So please go ahead and submit any questions you have throughout the presentation in the chat box located on your control panel. Um, I'd now like to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Alex Laska. Alex serves as the Transportation Policy Advisor for Third Way's Climate and Energy Program, where he focuses on advancing federal policies to eliminate carbon pollution from our transportation sector and make transportation network cleaner, safer, and more accessible for everyone. He has previously worked on transportation issues in Congress and at the Eno Center for Transportation. Go ahead, Alex. Great, well, thank you so much, May. Um, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here uh, with you and with Transportation for America to talk about something that is so important and that Congress is currently focused on. So as um, uh, May mentioned, if you wanna advance to the next slide, please. Um, the mission of Third Way uh, where I am the transportation policy advisor, is to advance the policies that will get the United States on the path to net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest. Uh, this is, of course, going to include decarbonizing transportation as much as possible. And if you go to the next slide, please, uh, we really can't talk about addressing climate change without talking about transportation. It is the single largest contributor of carbon pollution in our country. It's been that way for a few years now, and it's getting worse. Uh, you can see on that graph there that uh, despite transportation emissions declining during the Great Recession years, uh, it has been climbing back up, even as other sectors like the power sector, uh, buildings and industry have either been decreasing or uh, remaining relatively stagnant. Uh, so if we sort of zoom into transportation uh, on the next slide, uh, you'll see that most transportation emissions come from driving. Passenger vehicles for the most part, but also from medium and heavy duty vehicles like buses and trucks. But the bulk of it does come from cars. Uh, now, if we're going to take climate change seriously, it's going to require a holistic approach that includes rail and aviation and maritime shipping. But if we're really serious about fighting climate change, we have to address the climate impacts of driving. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we do that? How do we address uh, the climate impacts of driving? So when we're talking about emissions from transportation, we like to talk about a three-legged stool. In other words, there are three sort of main factors that interact with one another and combine to determine how emissions intensive a particular vehicle or a form of travel is going to be. So the first leg of that stool is fuel efficiency. So how many miles to the gallon your car can drive, for example. Uh, the second uh, leg of that stool is the carbon intensity of the fuel your vehicle is using. So however much fuel your vehicle needs to burn, how emissions intensive, how clean or how dirty is that fuel? And then the third leg of the stool is how far you're driving that vehicle or how long you're driving it for, which we call uh, vehicle miles traveled or VMT. And we need to make progress in all three of these areas 
because if we improve two of them but neglect the third, that can actually wipe out any progress we made in those first two. And that's exactly what we've been seeing with emissions from driving over the past few decades now. Even though our cars are getting more fuel efficient and our fuel is generally getting cleaner, uh, we're still driving more every year. And so emissions from driving is still increasing uh, generally. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, very often our policymakers only talk about two legs of the stool, fuel efficiency and the fuel. Um, so fuel efficiency in terms of protecting and, and ramping up the corporate average fuel economy standards uh, for cars and light trucks, for example, and the fuel itself in terms of you know, supporting the renewable fuel standard, uh, supporting higher ethanol blends and other policies that will help make our fuel cleaner uh, and promoting electric vehicles as part of that, uh, which of course use less liquid fuel. And all of that to be clear is great. Uh, we need folks who are in Congress and those of you who are out in the states on the ground across the country, uh, we need you championing those policies. But focusing on those two legs of the stool at the expense of the third, again, that means we're not tackling the problem from every angle we need to. Uh, and the next slide, please. Uh, we can see that several states that have been really ambitious on reducing emissions from driving are finding exactly this. In California, for example, they found that in addition to the fuel economy standard they have for cars and the zero emission vehicle standard they have in California, which is stricter than current federal policy, everyone in the state would still need to drive on average a mile and a half less per day in order for the state to reach its 2030 climate target. So you see BMT is coming into the picture here. Hawaii and Minnesota have found similar. Again, just making the cars themselves cleaner isn't really enough. We also need to make it easier for people to get access to everything they need to get to their job, uh, economic opportunities, services, healthcare, school, uh, without having to drive as much as they have to now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the same is true at the federal level. Uh, we can see on this slide that the current projections show that fuel economy will continue increasing uh, over the next several years, which is a good thing, and that electric vehicles will continue capturing more market share, which is also a good thing. But what we're finding is that the emissions reduction we would see as a result of those two trends is undermined by the fact that driving is also projected to increase. So much so, in fact, we're actually on track to miss the emission reduction targets we need to reach in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So we need to change that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's a great thing that so many in Congress, and I know I said this before, but I, I really mean it. It's so important that uh, folks in Congress understand the importance of making our cars more fuel efficient, getting more electric and other zero emission vehicles on the road. It's a really important part of the solution and Third Way is absolutely broadly supportive of those efforts. But what I hope you'll take away from my segment, which I'm wrapping up uh, here, is that we also need to focus on advancing the policies that will help us reduce vehicle miles traveled by better connecting people to the things they need without having to drive as much as they do now. Now there is good news because we already know how to do that. Uh, transportation for America and Third Way have been putting out policy recommendations for making our transportation network cleaner and more sustainable, in addition to making it safer uh, and more accessible and just more pleasant for everybody. And the rest of today's webinar is, is largely focused on what Congress needs to do in this upcoming service reauthorization to get this bill right and get us on a path to reduce VMT and reduce transportation emissions. And that'll mean investing more in public transit, investing more in intercity passenger rail, avoiding uh, building out more highway lane miles unless they're really needed uh, and things like that. Um, and there's more good news on top of that because the House of Representatives has already passed a bill uh, for the service reauthorization that would accomplish a lot of those goals. And Third Way absolutely sees that bill, which is the Invest in America Act as part of the larger sort of moving forward legislative package that was passed a few months ago. We really see that as the right path forward for service transportation. And we strongly encourage our friends in the House to continue championing that bill and the climate provisions in it. And we absolutely encourage our friends on the Senate side to take a serious look at the House bill and really look at what that bill does to go above and beyond what the Senate uh, Environment and Public Works Committee reported last summer to get us on a faster path to decarbonizing transportation. 
So on behalf of Third Way, again, thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to answering any questions you all have uh, at the end of the webinar. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, about this topic or anything else related to transportation. Uh, Third Way is always happy to help, so please consider us a resource. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back to you, May. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alex. That was a really great introduction on the relationship between climate and transportation and teases off well for the next presenter, which is Scott Goldstein. Scott is the Deputy Director for Transportation for America. Um, excuse me, Deputy Director for Transportation at Smart Growth America and the Policy Director for Transportation for America. Two titles there. Um, prior to joining Transportation for America, Scott worked as the Congressional Relations Officer for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, WMATA. Before WMATA, Scott served as Legislative Director for Congressman Henry Johnson in Georgia, where he managed the legislative team and focused on transportation, health, foreign affairs, and energy policy. Scott also served in Congressman David Scott's office, handling scheduling and constituent relations. Scott received his bachelor's in political science from Emory University and his master's in public management from Johns Hopkins University. And with that, I will turn it over to Scott who will give us a little bit more information on this issue. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, May, and hello, everybody. Um, I really appreciate you all joining us today for this, uh, what I hope will be an informative webinar and certainly a very important topic. Um, it's very hard to follow Alex, but I'm gonna do my best. Uh, so we'll just jump right in. Um, a Transportation for America, and first, uh, let me just say that if you're not familiar with us, we're um, a national nonprofit. Uh, our mission is to um, uh, see a transportation system built that um, efficiently, safely, and affordably moves people um, to jobs and services uh, with minimal impact on the environment. Um, and we are a program of Smart Growth America. Um, and so when we look at um, federal policy, um, as, as Alex said, you know, too often the conversation is about cafe standards and electrification um, as the solution to, to climate and transportation. Um, but at, at an even higher level, too often the conversation is about funding and what's going to happen with the gas tax and how are we going to pay for our investments. Um, but from my organization's perspective, and I think um, what you'll see in the report we did jointly with Third Way, uh, is that we do not just have a funding problem, uh, we have a policy problem. Um, uh, just as a brief refresher um, for everybody, so we're, uh, we're all working from the same sort of set of facts, um, just a brief overview of what a transportation authorization is. Um, that is approval or renewal of policy and funding amounts. Uh, it's generally for five years. Um, the current law, which is called the FAST Act, expires on September 30th. Um, and so Congress has been working to try to reauthorize that law. Uh, they have not made enough progress, and we see uh, the most likely scenario is um, an extension of current law for some period of time. Uh, but what you've had happen is that in the Senate, you have multiple committees that have jurisdiction over this issue. The Environment and Public Works Committee um, has jurisdiction over um, highways, and they are the only committee in the Senate that has taken any action. Whereas in the House, um, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee has broad jurisdiction. They've passed the Invest in America Act that Alex mentioned. Um, it went to the House floor, which, and it was approved as part of a larger uh, bill called the Moving Forward Act. Uh, and this bill, the Invest in America Act, is a five-year bill. It authorizes highways, transit, passenger rail, and it makes substantial reforms. Uh, and as you heard, I'm going to talk about how the House and Senate bills differ on climate. Uh, okay. So my organization has three priorities, and you'll see them reflected, uh, I think, in the, the report we did jointly with Third Way. Uh, and I'll talk about all of these in more detail. But our first priority is maintenance. We want to see any bill um, cut the maintenance backlog in half and have the policy and the funding directed towards that. Uh, in, our, in our view, the House bill does that and the Senate bill does not. We want to see any bill um, realize that speed is a major factor in roadway crashes, in, in safety, um, and frankly, in the use of transit uh, and, and uh, facilitating biking and walking. We want to see legislation that addresses speed as a major cause of, of safety issues. Uh, we see that in the House bill, and we do not see that in the Senate bill. Uh, and access. Um, we want to see a transportation system that is organized around connecting people to jobs and services, not exclusively about moving vehicles as quickly as possible. Uh, again, we see that in the House bill. We do not see that in the Senate bill. Here you see a, a lot of information. It's the overview of a scorecard that we did with Third Way. 
um, which took the report we wrote that said, here's what we want to see from a, a climate and transportation perspective. And then we ranked both the House and Senate bill according to that uh, report. And you can see the high level ranking here. Um, you see four different categories, make public transit a priority, make the current roadway system more efficient, measure the outcomes that support uh, today's goals, including climate and access, and promote inner city passenger rail. I'm gonna talk about all of those in more detail, but here you can see the full ranking. So moving on to our, our first category, it's uh, make public transit a priority. Uh, you know, as you're probably familiar, chronic underfunding uh, throughout the country has left too many communities with poor uh, and deteriorating uh, transit service, service that is infrequent, service that is unreliable. Uh, and so as a result, too many people are forced to drive and they're forced to drive further and further because they're not served by transit. Uh, this increases emissions uh, and this uh, leads to land use choices that um, further force people to drive further and further. Uh, in addition to that, we're in the middle of a, um, a crisis, certainly a public health and economic crisis. Investing in transit provides many benefits to communities on the climate perspective, certainly, on the access perspective, it helps people get out of congestion. But on the economic front, um, uh, there are more jobs in transit uh, operations and transit maintenance than there are uh, in traditional roadway investments. Uh, and so um, investing in transit has a whole uh, suite of benefits to communities. So when we look at the House and Senate bill, um, we had a number of things that we wanted to see that would um, uh, make public transit a priority and therefore um, help respond to the climate crisis. We wanted to see legislation that electrified uh, transit bus systems. Uh, and in full disclosure, the Senate bill is only a highways bill. The committee with jurisdiction over uh, transit has not acted in the Senate. So none of these are represented in the Senate bill. So electrifying transit bus systems, we don't see that in the Senate bill. We do see that in the House uh, Invest Act. Providing more money for transit, including for operations. Again, we see that in the House Invest Act. Improving the capital investment grant program. This is the program that um, provides funding for new and expanded public transit systems around the country. There's significant reforms and significant new funding in the Invest Act. Uh, and last, promoting transit-oriented development. Uh, there's significant policy in the Invest Act that um, would, uh, would leverage transit investment with transit-oriented development. Uh, we think uh, that's a, a huge step forward. And again, that's not part of the, um, the Senate bill. So, um, you know, overall, we were very pleased with the public transit uh, provisions of the House bill. Um, the second category of our report is to make the current roadway system more efficient. Um, currently, our road network pr uh, prioritizes high-speed vehicle travel, virtually at, at the expense of everything else. Um, and so there's very little consideration for people who are walking, who are biking, who are taking transit. Uh, and the road network is very important, certainly for walking, biking, and taking transit. Every transit um, trip begins and ends as a pedestrian. Many of them begin and end as a cyclist. Uh, and so we need our road network to be integrated with our transit networks uh, so that um, transit is safe and convenient, walking and biking is safe and convenient. So we wanna see complete streets. We wanna see uh, prioritizing maintenance. Uh, so that our road network uh, can be maintained and certainly built uh, to support complete streets and safety. Um, and on the point of maintenance, uh, there uh, we'll talk about this more in a minute, but uh, currently federal policy does not require maintenance. And so we see roadway expansion happening uh, all over the country while our maintenance backlog um, uh, grows virtually everywhere. Uh, and all this expansion uh, incentivizes more driving. Uh, that's something called induced demand that many of you may be familiar with. And all that additional driving is what's offsetting the gains in electrification and CAFE standards that Alex talked about earlier. So here's a slide that shows um, what's been going on over the last couple of decades um, around safety. Uh, as you can see, it's been, uh, it's been getting increasingly more safe to be a driver or a passenger in a vehicle, but it's becoming increasingly less safe to be somebody who's outside of a vehicle, a pedestrian, a cyclist, or a motorcyclist. Uh, and fatalities are rising um, uh, significantly for those who are outside of a vehicle. Uh, and it's even worse uh, for uh, communities of color and low-income communities. And this is just one um, picture that illustrates the problem. Uh, this is a picture that's probably similar to uh, what you find in your community, uh, wherever you may be from. Uh, and this is infrastructure that is not built uh, for any other purpose than moving those vehicles as quickly as possible. 
yet you do have people who are waiting for a bus and, and trying to ride bikes. Here's another picture that's uh, all too common. Uh, this woman is crossing uh, what looks to be a six lane road uh, with no safe crossing. Uh, and again, that's all too common in this country. When it comes to maintenance, we see too much of the left, which is ribbon cuttings and expansion. Uh, and that's coming at the expense of what you see on the right, um, which is maintenance. And here is just one of uh, many stats we could, we could throw at you, but 37 states saw an increase in the percentage of roads in poor condition between 2009 and 2017. And that's despite significant new funding um, being poured into the transportation system during that time. So what do we want to see on this front um, to respond to climate change uh, and make uh, policy reforms? We wanted to see um, streets designed to make them safe for biking and walking. Uh, we call for, in our report, $4.5 billion fund to retrofit roadways uh, and turn them into complete streets. We don't see that in the Senate EPW uh, proposal. We do see something substantially similar to that in the House bill. There are reforms throughout the bill that prioritize biking and walking, integrate the roadway network with transit, put a priority on the safety of vulnerable road users. Um, we wanted to see uh, the, the policy prioritize maintenance over expansion. Uh, again, we do not see that in the Senate proposal. We do see in the House bill a requirement that um, roadway uh, maintenance be prioritized before expansion. Unfortunately, both bills we think miss the mark on uh, ensuring that new vehicle technologies do not lead to emissions. Uh, but when it comes to pricing, which is our last um, policy recommendation in this section, uh, the House bill would use pricing to reduce emissions and congestion. And once again, the Senate bill uh, does not include that. So our third criteria or third category, I should say, was uh, that we wanted to see um, any federal legislation measure the outcomes that support today's goals. Um, specifically, we wanted to see performance measures, which are federal requirements that states uh, meet certain targets. Uh, and in this case, we wanted to see performance measures for reduced greenhouse gases and vehicle miles traveled per capita. And we also wanted to see um, that the system measure how well the transportation system connects people to destinations. This is critically important because um, currently there's no accountability for reducing emissions or reducing DMT. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the system, which allocates funding based on the amount of miles driven and the amount of fuel burn, you, you actually have a perverse incentive as a state to um, increase greenhouse gases and increase vehicle miles traveled. That's how you get additional federal funding. Uh, and as I said earlier, the current system does not, um, uh, is not based around whether people have access to the things they need. It's based around how quickly are vehicles moving. And so we wanted to see a system that instead measures how well the system connects people to destinations. Right here, you're looking at a chart. Um, this uh, is describing something called level of service that many may be familiar with. Um, level of service A is a free flowing highway or roadway with very little congestion or or um, uh, reason to slow down at all, all the way down to level of service F, which is um, slow speeds and, and what we think of as congestion. And so the goal right now is level of service A. But if you look at this slide, on the left, you see level of service A. Those vehicles on that road uh, can move as quickly as the speed limit may allow because there's nothing in the way. Uh, and that is a success. Um, on the right, you see an economically vibrant corridor uh, that may be a level of service F because there's red lights, there's buses, there's people trying to cross the street, uh, but this is a vibrant corridor. But everything about our current policy says to build what you see on the left and not on the right. And on the left, walking and biking and transit um, are undermined and on the right, um, they are more of an option. And this is just a graphic that illustrates um, how this works out um, uh, in communities across the country. On the top, you have uh, somebody mowing uh, the entire garden to kill all the weeds, but it's also killing the flowers. Uh, and on, you, on the bottom, you have um, somebody taking the same attitude towards the city, uh, mowing down everything in the city uh, to try to get rid of traffic congestion. Uh, and we see that in too many places as highways are widened um, and, and they're not made um, accessible or supportive of people biking and walking. Uh, and uh, that's obviously going to um, undermine making biking and walking transit um, viable and safe options. And to further illustrate this point, um, adding all this highway capacity um, is, is not solving our problem. If congestion really is the thing we want to deal with, vehicle speed is the thing we want to prioritize, we're not accomplishing that goal. Freeway capacity has grown faster than population uh, since 1993 uh, in the top 100 metro areas. Yet congestion, as you can see on the bottom there, has increased 144% uh, 
across those areas. And so we're building the freeways. We're, we're building them faster than, than population is growing, but congestion is increasing. And I won't walk through all of these different cities, but uh, I just want to say that expanding freeways equivalent to population growth um, has led to more delay. Expanding freeways faster than population growth has led to more delay. And expanding freeways in places with slow or no population growth has also led to more delay. Uh, and so what we're doing is not working even for the problem we're trying to solve for, uh, and it's the wrong problem. And the reason it's not working is that people are driving more every day. In 1993, people drove 21 miles per day. Uh, and in 2017, people drove 25 miles per day. Uh, and so all this increase in driving is leading to all this congestion. Um, all this new highway capacity is inducing all that additional driving, uh, which as Alex said earlier, um, is undermining um, all the gains in efficiency and, uh, and cafe uh, and electrification. So finally, on this, on this, um, in this section, what do we wanna see in any bill? Um, we want to see performance measures for reducing greenhouse gases and vehicle miles traveled per capita. Um, that's not reflected in the Senate bill, uh, and it's partially reflected in the House bill. The House bill includes a requirement um, that there be a performance measure for reducing greenhouse gases. Um, there is no vehicle miles traveled performance measure, so uh, that's why we gave it uh, that, that half score. Um, we wanted to see um, that the system be measured according to how well it connects people to destinations. Uh, the Senate bill gets a half score because there is a pilot program to start doing this around the country. We thought that was a, a good idea back in July of 2019 when, when the Senate passed this bill. But the House bill goes much further. The House bill includes a performance measure uh, to use access as, a, uh, as, a, as the way to organize state systems, and states are held accountable to that. Uh, if they do not improve access by every mode of travel, then they are penalized in their highway program. Uh, and finally, we wanted to see a bike clean standard for federally funded projects, and neither bill includes that. This is our last section, and so we're getting to the end of my presentation and looking forward to your questions. Um, but we wanted to see legislation um, promote inner city passenger rail. Uh, passenger rail, as I'm sure everybody knows, is much less carbon intensive than flying. It brings economic um, benefits to communities uh, because the stations are right in the heart of downtown. Um, but unfortunately, we have chronically underinvested in passenger rail, just like we have in, uh, in transit. Uh, and so we want to see um, dedicated funding, um, like virtually every other mode um, of, uh, of surface transportation. Uh, this would allow for large multi-year capital projects and real, um, ultimately interstate and viable um, and reliable service. Um, and we want to see um, uh, policy that promotes um, state and regional efforts um, to have new and improved passenger rail that crosses state lines. So we look at the two bills, what do we see? Um, in full disclosure, the Senate bill is the Highways Bill, as I said earlier, so it does not cover this issue, um, but the House uh, Invest Act does. Um, there is stable funding and significant funding in the House Invest Act. Um, and while they don't include uh, exactly what we called for on, their inter on the intercity rail commissions, um, there's some significant policy that tries to improve uh, interstate um, cooperation, and so we gave it um, uh, a half score. So to wrap up here, if it's not already clear, um, the House Invest Act, uh, that the Invest in America Act, goes very big on climate. Uh, climate is embedded throughout. Uh, you saw where it ranked according to our agenda. Um, it had uh, measures for greenhouse gas emissions and access to jobs and services. Uh, it makes significant improvement towards electrifying vehicle and transit fleets. Um, there's significant new uh, investment and policy around public transit. There's more money. Um, policy uh, is there to incentivize better and more service. Um, and then there's integration with biking and walking and a comprehensive uh, approach to improving safety. And finally, there's frankly a lot to, to say about this bill, but finally, there's a series of new programs. You see some of them mentioned there um, that would really move the ball forward and are competitive so the best projects would rise uh, to the surface and get funded. So, what do we need and what are we asking from everybody on this uh, on this webinar? Um, it's time for Congress to go bold and to go big on the climate and transportation front. Um, we need climate advocates like those of you who are here um, listening today to understand that climate and transportation are inseparable. Uh, we cannot uh, consider the transportation debate as separate or distinct from climate. Uh, we can only address climate change by addressing transportation. Um, and we have to look at the INVEST Act, the House approach, and the EPW bill uh, the Senate approach, and recognize that they represent dramatically different approaches. 
And uh, when you look at the two, the INVEST Act is the only proposal that meaningfully addresses climate change. Um, and so, uh, you know, unfortunately, there are forces of the status quo that are fighting um, the proposals in the, uh, in the House bill. And uh, we need climate advocates, those of you who are here today, and those of you who may talk to folks uh, out in your community, uh, to recognize that um, we need to put the same effort into defending um, these reforms as uh, the forces of the status quo are, are doing into fighting these reforms. And lastly, what can you do? Um, after this webinar, we are going to send you template letters, uh, excuse me, a template letter that you can send to your senator explaining why uh, you or your organization want them to go bigger on climate than the Environment and Public Works Committee's transportation bill. Um, we encourage you to submit a letter to the editor, to your local newspaper, uh, explaining why the House Invest Act is better for climate uh, than the EPW Committee's transportation bill. And we're also going to send you our social media toolkit, uh, and you can use that uh, to join our Twitter chat, which I believe is going to be on Thursday, uh, to urge the Environment and Public Works Committee to start over. And this is very important because, and I'm going to wrap up here, um, the, uh, the House and Senate are almost certainly going to extend current law um, before the end of this month. Uh, so Congress will reconvene in the new, in the new year. it will be a new Congress. It'll be a new administration, um, you know, whether uh, another four years of the current administration or a, a totally new administration. Um, and we uh, encourage uh, folks to, to make the case that when, they, when Congress looks at the transportation uh, policy debate, that they look at the House bill as the starting point and not the Senate bill. So with that, um, I'm gonna wrap up. We look forward to taking your questions and thank you so much for your time. And that's right, I forgot. I'm supposed to um, bring up some of the questions. Um, unfortunately, I don't see them all there, uh, but I have a few that have been sent to me uh, in my email. And so uh, May, if you're still on the call, if you wanna make sure I don't miss any, uh, let me know. But the first question Definitely that we got- do that. Um, was regarding the VMT issue, uh, vehicle miles traveled. And the question was, are there provisions for a Dutch style system of bicycle commuter tax credits in any of the bills? And are any of the presidential candidates on record as supporting uh, this system? And I'm happy to answer that, but I've been talking for a minute, so I'll see if Alex wants to weigh in. Yeah, well, so I know that the uh, Moving Forward Act, uh, again, that larger uh, $1.5 trillion infrastructure bill that included the House's uh, surface reauthorization bill, included a piece of legislation that had been offered, I think, by Congressman Earl Blumenauer, which reinstates the uh, bicycle commuter tax benefit, I think, at a higher rate. It also expanded it to include not only people who just bike to work, but people who maybe take transit partway and bike the rest of the way or park somewhere and then bike the rest of the way. And it also expanded to include not just uh, sort of your own bicycle, but also bike sharing and uh, uh, electric assist bikes. So um, I'm not 100% sure sort of how that compares to uh, what the question referred to as like the Dutch style commuter tax benefit for people who bike to work, but there is something in there that would bring back something that I believe the Trump administration had uh, gotten rid of uh, pretty early on in its administration. Um, and then there's, of course, a lot more funding for building out the infrastructure that will enable people to uh, walk and bike to work more safely. And I don't believe that the EPW bill included that benefit. In fairness to them, I don't think they would have had jurisdiction over that since that's a tax issue um, and, and they don't have jurisdiction over that. That would be the Senate Finance Committee, but that's as much as I know about that. Um, thanks, Alec. That's a great question, and that um, uh, I don't have anything to add to that. Um, the next question that I have here: Do you think that there will be any change before the price of gasoline reaches um, four dollars a gallon again? Um, I, I think that the price of gasoline certainly has an effect on on policy. Um, uh, we are hoping that we can get, from my organization's perspective, that we can get policy reform. Um, uh, you know when the time is right, which is now. Uh, and if that happens to be when gasoline reaches a, a high price, so be it. But we are not gonna wait for that uh, to, to, to push reform. Um, we think that the urgency of the climate crisis uh, should be enough, uh, frankly. Um, we, we think that the safety crisis in our communities um, of people who are being killed and injured on our streets because our streets are not safe uh, for people biking and walking should be enough. Uh, we think the maintenance crisis should be enough. Um, with our maintenance backlog growing uh, virtually everywhere you look, despite um, substantial new funding, as I mentioned. Um, and so uh, we are hoping to see reform uh, for all those reasons. Um, 
but certainly the questioner is right. Um, if gasoline goes up, that um, that that can help uh, advance the cause. I don't know, Alex, if you had anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I certainly agree. From uh, in terms of talking about, you know what we're investing in, how we're investing, where we're investing in the infrastructure, uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, the time is now to make these investments. Um, I don't know if the questioner was also thinking about, you know, what additional funding we might need to bring in and how we would bring that in, um, since that also relates, of course, to the gas, uh, the price of gasoline, uh, where we're hearing a lot of folks on the Hill, and, uh, and this includes uh, Vice President Biden, uh, saying, you know, now is not the time to raise taxes on people given the current economic situation. Uh, at Third Way, we certainly appreciate that. Um, but that's also okay. We don't need to wait to make these investments. Uh, you know, we can take advantage of historically low interest rates and the fact that people just need this. They need the jobs it creates. They need the economic growth these infrastructure investments will create if we do it right. Uh, and they need the safety and accessibility improvements that they'll create as well. So, um, you know, in terms of how it relates to the price of gasoline, there's uh, you know, some interesting dynamics in terms of how we might raise the revenue in the future. Uh, but right now, we absolutely think uh, now's the right time to be doing it. Um, and then, uh, there was a comment. Um, somebody wrote uh, that they are concerned about the INVEST bill or the INVEST Act because it includes new highway construction through fragile, um, undisputed desert, undisrupted desert, excuse me, between Tucson and Las Vegas. Um, Alex, perhaps you're familiar with this specific project. I'm not, but um, uh, you know, certainly um, the Invest Act, from our perspective, is not perfect. Um, my organization has has um, you know flagged certain concerns that we have. Uh, for example, virtually 80% of the money is for highways uh, as opposed to transit. Um, despite all the improvements on the transit side that I mentioned, um, we still think that that number needs to be closer to 50/50 highways and transit. Um, and so that's just one of many things that we do see as uh, as flaws in the Invest Act. Um, I'd, I'd love to learn more about this specific project that is funded by the bill. I don't recall any earmarks in the bill for a specific project, so I'd want to learn a little bit more about that. Um, uh, but, you know, um, these are the types of things to flag when Congress, um, you know, restarts the process uh, in the next Congress. Um, even though the Invest Act, we would argue, should be the place to start and not the Senate proposal, uh, it's not perfect and there are reforms that should be made, and perhaps this is one area um, of reform. I don't know, Alex, do you have anything to add? No, I hadn't heard about that project either. And, and just to echo exactly what you said, um, I'm sure there are improvements that can be made to the Invest Act that will be made as the process moves along uh, into the next Congress. Um, so another question. Um, so vehicle, this is what the questioner wrote. VMT is heavily driven by local land use policies and sprawl. Land use decisions are made by local government and heavily influenced by developers. What can Congress do to influence the sprawl factor? Um, I'm more than happy to answer that, but Alex, I feel like I've been talking a lot, so maybe I'll just see if you have any thoughts. I was about to say the same thing about myself. No, uh, <laughs> well, so we put out uh, as part of our recommendations uh, some policy ideas specifically uh, to address this, and uh, two come to mind. The first is uh, unlocking more federal funding for transit-oriented development, So, uh, and particularly, by the way, for equitable transit-oriented development to make sure that everyone can benefit from that denser development with, you know, so much better access to transit so that we can make our cities large and small uh you know more accessible uh safer uh and and you know less carbon intensive in terms of the transportation for the folks who live there um so uh unlocking funding through uh for example the tifia program and other federal programs that already exist that can get uh funding into some of that transit oriented development to help uh combat some of the sprawl we're seeing the other is and this points exactly to what the questioner was talking about on uh zoning and sprawl because this is a very very difficult issue that um you know as they said uh is, is often dealt with at the local level and so what we were thinking about at third way at least was some kind of financial incentives for uh, towns or cities that update their zoning laws again to allow for denser development so that people can be closer to the things they need closer to school their job um, you know, eating and shopping uh, so that they can walk or bike or take transit and not have to take such long car trips. And I, I think Alex is spot on there. The only thing I would add is that um, federal policy has an enormous role to play in those local land use decisions. And this is something that, um, that we see federal policymakers maybe uh, are too often fully not appreciating. Um, so what do I mean? Um, if 80% of the money in transportation is for highways, and highway expansion, and the priority through that money is vehicle speed, uh, and it's not safety, it's not transit, 
um, it's not biking or walking, um, then uh, that's where states and localities are going to go. That's where they're going to um, invest. And they're going to make land use choices to support those federal funds and those investments. Uh, and so federal policy doesn't necessarily have to specify local land use choice, but by changing the federal incentives, we can change local land use choices. Uh, and so while the Invest Act um, certainly has things to say about uh, as, as we mentioned in the in the presentation, as Alex just mentioned, um, a lot of what it would do by prioritizing safety, by reinvesting in transit and passenger rail, is change the incentives uh, that local communities have, give them more options in terms of where uh, what they might build, um, and then the, we think that they will make corresponding land use choices. Um, that all said, my organization fully supports more direct federal uh, efforts to um, uh, you know, incentivize um, land use, uh, better land use making at the uh, land use choices at the local level. Alex just talked about one. Um, certainly happy to um, uh, uh, discuss with the questioner any further ideas. Um, the next question uh, is uh, the problem of streets and roads being too narrow to share with bikes and pedestrians is particularly bad in the Northeast US. Um, what pricing? Oh, that was that was the question. Excuse me. Um, that that may be case. Uh, may be the case. I, I hadn't heard that. Um, you know, often those narrower um, streets support slower vehicle speeds, uh, and um, uh, also support um, a more dense, walkable, uh, livable uh, transportation network, uh, which which uh, facilitates biking and walking. Um, and we we tend to see. Uh, the safety issues um, show up on the wider, um, straighter uh, um, roads that you find out in the suburbs and, and uh, across the Sun Belt uh, in the South and in the West. Um, but certainly happy to look into that more um, uh, from what the questioner wrote. Um, and if you can, you can forward on, um, you know, what you're seeing there, we'd love to see that. Alex, anything to add to that? Well, and admittedly, this is only tangentially related to the question, but one thing that's so interesting here when we're talking about, you know, making sure there's room for people who aren't in cars to use our infrastructure is to see what cities and towns, large and small, are doing in the age of COVID to make it easier for people who aren't in a car to get around while uh, staying safe and, and staying far away from each other. Um, here in, in Washington, D.C., where I'm located, they've put some you know what i guess we'll call temporary sidewalks where they just uh cone off uh parts of the road so that uh you know if you're passing someone on the sidewalk you have somewhere you can go to stay six feet away and so uh this has been a really interesting time to be involved in transportation policy especially at the local level to see how cities are sort of grappling with some of these challenges when it is so important not only not just that there is a sidewalk but that there's enough sidewalk that people who do walk or bike to work or to wherever they're going can do so safely. Excellent point. Um, the next question, um, and Alex, I think I might let you answer this um, unless you want to kick it over to me. But um, the question is, what pricing measure, uh, pricing measures are there to decrease congestion and emissions? Yeah. So something that uh, you know is in use in in several countries around the world that is only really just getting uh, a foothold here in the states uh, is congestion pricing. And uh, I, the interesting federal policy angle here is that you know while the while New York State passed a law allowing uh, New York City to implement a congestion pricing, things called cordon pricing, uh, in uh, downtown Manhattan. Um, it's been held up at the U.S. Department of Transportation, I think, for a year or two now, because this really is uncharted territory for the federal government. They don't even know what kind of environmental review the infrastructure needed to, you know, actually implement the the uh, congestion zone um, needs to go through. So we really need to make sure that federal policy keeps up. And from Third Way's perspective, you know, we certainly uh, support if a uh, city or state uh, or town decides that. Uh, congestion pricing is the right solution for them to reduce congestion. Keeping in mind, you're also raising money for something, and often that can go towards transit or something else that'll help, uh, you know, uh, undo some of the wrongs that our, uh, you know, current infrastructure have done uh, in terms of making it harder for people not in cars to get around. And so, um, you know, making sure that federal policy is not a hindrance to those efforts but allows for it um, is something that we think is really important that we. Uh, 
would frankly encourage uh, Congress to deal with in this upcoming service reauthorization, which uh, really, uh, there was uh, you know, something about that in the House bill, uh, but it is important that we modernize our federal regulation to allow for those kinds of projects to move forward. Very well said, couldn't agree more. Um, the next question was, is there any way to regulate motor vehicle speed, making sure that the only speed limit which should be uh, only allowed is either 30 or 35? Um, my organization is looking at that, um, and certainly there's ways to do that. You can make federal funding contingent on speed limits, um, and we think that's something that, that should be reviewed. Um, but we also um, want to focus on the design. Uh, because, um, you know, we can all uh, think about a road in our community where the speed limit might be 30 or 35, or it might be 20 or 25, and yet the road is straight, the lanes are wide, there are no stop signs or red lights or anything, and everything about the design of that road tells you to go much, much faster. Uh, and so people don't necessarily even intend to speed, but the design of the road uh, is setting them up to go much faster. And so we need speed limits um, uh, that are appropriate for our communities. Uh, the questioner is right, but we also need designs that uh, support safety. And I would just note that um, our sister program, the National Complete Streets Coalition, produces a report every year called Dangerous by Design, which lays out how roadway design uh, is so integral to uh, the safety crisis that we have in our communities. Um, Alex, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, nothing to add. Okay. Um, the next question is, isn't part of the problem that the state legislature must approve the establishment of any type of regional intergovernmental body? Um, I think what the questioner is talking about is the, the mention of uh, passenger rail, interstate cooperation on passenger rail. Uh, if not, I apologize and maybe send us a message in the chat and we'll uh, address that in a different forum. But um, my organization has done a lot of work with something called the Southern Rail Commission, which is a regional compact that is um, uh, recognized by an act of Congress that organized the states of Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama, believe it or not, together, uh, uh, and created an organization called the Southern Rail Commission that exists to promote passenger rail in those three states. And because they're a congressionally recognized entity, um, the Southern Rail Commission can negotiate directly with freight railroads, uh, can have a vision and, a, and, and support that vision of passenger rail, um, that, it, that it can exist beyond uh, any one governor, uh, or, or the term of any one governor or any one DOT. Uh, they can apply directly for federal funds um, and they can um, uh, invest in a project with those funds. Uh, and there's something similar in the Northeast uh, with Amtrak's Northeast Corridor. There's a, there's a commission there uh, and there's a, there's a Midwest uh, commission that's similar as well. Um, but we think that those commissions should be empowered, um, should be given more authority, um, and we think there should be more commissions. There's numerous places in the country, certainly, that we've been approached by um, that want to do more regional cooperation, and they think having such a commission um, would, would help them uh, get their projects off the ground. Because there's virtually no passenger rail project um, that exists within the confines of any one state. Uh, and so um, uh, to that end, that's why we wanted to see any legislation um, incentivize the creation of commissions. What we're talking about is federal funding that says, um, We'll, we'll get you started with a commission, we'll support the operations of that commission, and um, giving the commissions a priority um, for uh, federal capital funds uh, when, when there's different applications for those funds. So that's what we're talking about. Um, certainly, um, you know, as the questioner writes, um, state legislatures and, and all the uh, relevant state bodies are, are instrumental but, um, and, and can be an obstacle. Uh, or can certainly be supportive, but we want to see these commissions to um, try to have a vision that cannot last any one legislature, any one governor, any one DOT, uh, and, and, and connect this country with inner city passenger rail. Alex, anything to add? Um, I would only add that, uh, since you mentioned this uh, earlier in the presentation, the House bill uh, includes a lot of funding for uh, intercity passenger rail, and it, um, you know, it allows within sort of who can apply for this funding, um, you know, interstate uh, agreements. Um, it might even prioritize them. Uh, we would love to see, uh, you know, in a future iteration of this bill, um, funding being made available to stand up these commissions and to provide funding to actually get those new services off the ground, uh, in addition to just allowing them to apply for, you know, rail construction funding writ large. That's right. Um, the next question is, 
Uh, is there any move or incentive in the works to electrify America's railways, further reducing emissions? Um, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not aware of any specific program to that end, but I believe That's right. that, I believe that the Invest Act rail programs could be used for that purpose. Um, but yeah. That's right. And, you know, the, the challenge here is that the vast majority of America's railways are not electrified, uh, especially class one, you know, freight railways. And so in order to do that, you're talking about multiple trillions of dollars just to electrify um, railways. And, and that's multiple trillions of dollars that wouldn't go to anything else the federal government might spend money on. And so when we're talking about reducing emissions from rail, Certainly, if we're building out any new rail infrastructure, we should give serious consideration to electrifying that, but also, uh, you know, putting in the federal funding to help research and develop uh, sort of the future technologies of rail. So uh, hydrogen powered trains, for example, something that is getting more attention in Europe and, and something that would certainly help reduce emissions from uh, rail here in the United States without having to make again, trillions of dollars in investment in the infrastructure, since those hydrogen powered trains uh, could be retrofitted uh, and you know, be able to use the existing infrastructure the way it is now. So there's there are a couple of different uh, ways you can go about reducing emissions from rail, recognizing it's already a very low emission way of moving a lot of uh, people or a lot of products vis-a-vis -vis driving. That's a very good point. Um, the next question, I think, is going to have a quick answer. Um, the question was, when is the INVEST Act going to be passed or voted on? Uh, and it, it passed the House on July 1st, and it was part, as I think Alex and I both mentioned, of a larger package called the Moving Forward Act. So the INVEST Act never got a vote by itself. Of the law, part of that bigger package, which included a whole host of other things from education to, um, uh, uh, you know, wastewater, uh, and other sorts of infrastructure in addition to the transportation piece. But the INVEST Act was, I believe, a third of that larger moving forward act in terms of the overall price and content. Uh, and so it was the biggest piece. And um, from our perspective, we really just focus on the INVEST Act. The other issues in the larger package are outside of my organization's mission. Um, and we certainly um, hope that the Senate would consider the framework outlined by, um, by the House. The next question was, um, Oh, and I should say that the Senate, um, within hours, um, said that they would not take up the INVEST Act. Uh, at least the Senate leadership said that. Um, the, the next question was, now that large employers are keeping much of their workforce at home, would they lobby to increase walking and biking infrastructure? Um, uh, they'll become less eager to find public transport. I think, um, I'm trying to, it's not clear what that last part of the question is, but um, and Alex, you may have uh, certainly have thoughts to add to this. Um, we are seeing um, a sea change in 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 support for biking and walking um, uh, during this current public health crisis. As Alex mentioned, there's a an effort to um, you know use uh, public street space for socially distanced exercise and outside activities for people. Um, you know how that will translate into permanent policy change. An advocacy from from the business community, I think, is to be seen, but it's certainly something that um, uh, you know we are tracking. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say um, on this is that, um, in general, um, the business community has been fairly supportive of of transit um, and walkable transit connected communities um, over the years. And, and certainly, this public health crisis uh, may change that. But over the years, we've seen that businesses want to locate in transit served walkable communities because that's where their workforce wants to be. Um, and so uh, whether it's in Salt Lake City where they're trying to um, uh, organize their transportation system uh, so that it supports more transit uh, and, and bikeable walkable communities as a business uh, incentive or whether it's um, the national you know, um, uh, competition for Amazon's second headquarters which was organized around transit connected communities we're seeing that from, from the largest companies, the Fortune 500s, and small companies, that that's where they want uh, to locate. Again, how the current crisis will change that is, is to be seen, um, but we, we do see a lot of support from the business community. But we do not see, and Alex, maybe um, you'd have thoughts on this too, um, that that's been a major um, part of the business community's advocacy, and that's something that, that my organization has been working on. Um, we have a coalition called Chambers for Transit of uh, local chambers from around the country that we have put together that are actively supporting more uh, investment in public transit. 
And we're always eager to work with the business community because we think that's a critical voice on, on these issues. So Alex, I don't know if there's anything else to add on, on that point. No, I mean, you said it all. I mean, I'm always hesitant to speculate on how COVID will change, uh, you know, travel patterns, work from home patterns long term, uh, just because this is so unprecedented. And we really don't know whether, you know, when we get on the other side of this, you know, will things go back to normal all the way or part way or not at all? In fact, the uh, the Eno Center for Transportation, a former employer of mine, had a really interesting webinar um, with a professor from um, the Georgia Institute of Technology, whose name is escaping me, but uh, they were talking about, you know, how previous, uh, you know, disruptions, you know, small and large have, you know, changed uh, work from home uh, patterns for a little while, but then things sort of, uh, you know, bounce back. Uh, and so it, it's hard to know how this will change uh, infrastructure decisions. Uh, and, and, you know, certainly my employer is advocating for more funding for walking and biking infrastructure. Uh, I can attest to that since I'm doing that advocacy work for them. But um, in terms of, you know, what companies who are seeing sort of what their workforces are doing uh, during COVID-19, it's just, it's really hard to say how things will shake out long term. Um, and I'm just, I'm looking at the clock, it's 2.56, so um, we probably can't get through every question, uh, but we'll try to get through a couple more before um, three o'clock when we have to wrap up. Uh, the next question was, um, how can college age students and climate and transportation activists help amplify, amplify the importance of this issue? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think uh, the answer there is to make sure that your Congress member, your contacts um, are educated about um, all the issues that are involved with transportation and climate. We have to have more efficient vehicles, which means we have to have cafe standards. We have to have um, vehicle electrification, but we also have to have um, a system that allows people the choice to bike or walk or take transit. We cannot deal with climate change if we only focus on um, efficiency and electrification. And too often at federal policy, that's all we focus on. Um, and then the states make decisions based on that federal focus. And um, you get where we are today, where emissions are rising in transportation. Uh, and that, that um, will not uh, um, be sufficient to, to deal with climate change. So I think it's incredibly important to, to educate folks and to really uh, make the case that, um, you know, our transportation policy at the federal level um, hasn't changed much over the last few decades. But the way that people have, uh, the way that people move around communities, the places that people want to live, um, have changed. Um, we finished building the interstate system that President Eisenhower outlined in 1956, and yet we still have federal policy uh, designed to build that interstate system. Uh, we, need, we need new policy. We cannot just continue um, making marginal changes to yesterday's policy. Uh, so um, I know that's a lot there, but that's kind of uh, how I would handle this and, and what I would encourage you to say to your, uh, to your contacts. Alex, anybody, anything else to add? Well, I know uh, Transportation for America is, you know, organizing a social media toolkit and we'll be sending out a template letter to the editor for folks who want to get involved. I mean, that is a really great way to make sure other people in your community and your community leaders um, know, you know, what your opinion is on this and, and how important it is that we go big on this uh, next service reauthorization because we're going to take climate change seriously and get to net zero by 2050. There are only so many five-year service reauthorizations between then and now. This next one needs to be the one that gets us on that path to net zero by 2050, including decarbonizing transportation as much as we can. Um, I think that's that's a great point. And you know, as the representative from Transportation for America on the call, I should have been the one to mention that. But thank you for doing that for me, Alex. Um, of course. Um, so uh, there's a question. I think this might be the last one, just given the time. Uh, it seems that state DOTs, with the enormous responsibility for funding highway maintenance, are driving the narrative to prioritize highways rather than transit, um, EV, and multimodal options. Are there efforts to partner with their national association to shift the narrative? Um, from my organization's perspective, uh, we are looking to partner with anybody we can. We work closely with lots of state DOTs, with the national um, organization that represents state DOTs. Um, but we want to we want to see bigger and bolder change than oftentimes is what's being requested at the DOT level, um, and uh, you know we understand that uh, that there might be a difference of opinion, um, but that's why we we work with the business community that I mentioned earlier. That's why we work with advocates like all the folks on this call today, uh, and so many other groups 
Uh, and so we will continue to work with the, the state DOTs and partner where we can. Uh, and where we can't, we will we will disagree and, and advocate uh, for our position. I don't know, Alex, if there's anything else you wanted to add. Um, I just add um, that you know there are some state DOTs who are really doing the right thing in terms of maintenance, uh, focusing on maintenance, uh, building out EV infrastructure, um, uh, and things like that. Uh, but for those that are maybe uh, laggard DOTs, shall we say, uh, it's important that the federal policy is in place to make sure that uh, they're doing the right thing and that they're not building out new things that will fall into disrepair because they don't have a plan to take care of them or that they're leaving people who don't have a car, can't have a car or you know choose not to, um, that they're not being left stranded, that we're investing in transit and biking and walking infrastructure and things like that. So just as Scott said, always happy to work with anyone who uh, wants to uh, take this seriously and, and uh, invest in the infrastructure that'll help connect people to the things they need better uh, and make our transportation network cleaner. Yeah, and, and on that point, I know we're, we're at the end of time, but um, in the uh, run up to the passage of the INVEST Act, um, we worked um, with some you know, conservative organizations um, to support uh, a, a focus on, on maintenance first. Uh, so, you know, we, are, we will work with anybody um, who, um, uh, who, who supports the same policies that, that we support. Um, but I think we're, we're past time, it's 3.01. Um, 80 of you have stayed till the end, so thank you of that, or thank you for that. Um, my colleague is reminding me that in addition to um, the, the letter template that we're going to send you after this call, um, we will also be sharing a social media toolkit that um, we hope that you'll use tomorrow uh, during the, the Twitter storm that we're doing, and we'll send more information and details about the timing of that. Um, we'll also put up a recap blog uh, on, our, on our blog. Uh, maybe we'll work a third way to cross-post it, I don't know, um, but we'll try to cover uh, all the questions that we that we got to as well as those that we did not get to um, so look out for that as well and thank you so much for your participation